welcome to Movies, Films, and Flicks. I am Mark Hoffmeyer, and joining me is a man that has miles of cars in his front yard. It's John Levengood. So I must have a front yard like the White House then, because that's a that's a lot of space of cars. Well, you go up, and your neighbors are very worried, because you have, what, 18 Dodge Neons stacked uh, in 10 different rows in your front yard. So it's like the junkyard in The Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3. Yeah, or 13 Ghosts. Okay, very good. (laughs) So, okay, John, can you just do me a favor? And this is since this is our 350th episode and we talk about a Kurt Russell movie every 25 episodes, we kind of missed one last 25, but we made up for it with Stargate. John, explain this movie, Used Cars 1980, directed by Robert Zemeckis and written by Bob Gale, Back to the Future, Forrest Gump. I mean, every movie can Polar Express. So many movies. John, explain Used Cars in 20 words or less. <laughs> oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Uh, a shyster car salesman with high ambitions and a big secret mm-hmm. must protect his business. <laughs> <laughs> okay, There's look. There's a lot it's... to it. This is a movie. I, I... Um, right, well, one more time, his, one more time. I don't even got? know. Well, while I, I don't know, I, I, well, it's like while protecting a secret. I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I, you know where I'm going. But yeah, it's hard. And whatever, if I give a one, if I give a 20 second description, no one is going to know what to. You know what I, I should say? A, a lampoon. Shy- Ooh. Okay, ready? A shyster car salesman with a secret must protect his business while pursuing his dreams. In this lampoonish R-rated comedy, I like it. I like uh, let that. me let me give it a shot. All right. A a oh man. Uh, let's see. A shiesty car salesman with hopes of becoming a corrupt politician <laughs> must keep a car lot afloat for a few days. Right. <laughs> Working. <laughs> Thwarting the owner's, the dead owner's brother, if you were to just say it. <laughs> this is a, John, all right, so this is a raucous film. And I, I bought the Shout Factory release. I listened to the commentaries. There's hours worth of just do, like interviews with Bob Gale. And this is a slightly cynical, insane kind of black comedy. This is a dark comedy. I mean, in the first part of this movie, Jack Warden, you know, Fuchs. He dies, they bury him in their, I don't know, in a pit, and then they proceed to just lie and connive to sell cars and try to, it's just a shysty, and he wants to become a corrupt politician. His whole goal is to get $10,000 so he can become a corrupt politician. Right. Well, and I love it. The, he had the other forty or 50000 yeah. that he needed, yeah. so he just needed ten grand more. But what's interesting is that all these characters on the... On the on the on our protagonists, um, these antiheroes, if you will, uh, Carlot, though you like them, you're yes. rooting for them. This movie does. I, I, I forgive the phrasing of this for my moral uh, fiber, but this movie rewards lying and highly felonious, destructive behavior mm-hmm. uh, and lascivious behavior. And you're still a hundred percent on their side all of the time. They are, they are, they, they, they do the things that horrible people do, but the characters don't seem like horrible people. I want to explore something with you and you make a great point about this because part of it's Kurt Russell. I mean, he is the shyster of all shysters in this. I mean, just, and then Jeff and I mean, Jim's cool, but these guys are like, they cover up death and they're just, They're very 1980 characters, but the thing is, in the commentary, what they were saying is these guys were still good at their jobs. So Kurt Russell, I mean, he could polish a, he could sell a ketchup popsicle to a woman with white gloves. He sells these cars to people and then the bumper falls off immediately. Like they're just, he is polishing, like turning back the, the uh, odometer. He is just one of the most dishonest car salesmen on the planet, but he's good at it. They seem smart. They seem... Uh, capable. And so in a lot of these movies, right, where there's anti-heroes, I think you can kind of like them a little bit more if they're good at it. 
at something. Like you don't want to watch a anti-hero who's not good at something. I don't know. That, but that's what they said in this. Like they're good car salesmen. There's terrible people, but that helps make them more likable. And I agree with that. I you, think that you, they're good at selling cars, but they're not good salesmen. <laughs> yeah. Because well, they're fooling you. They're yeah. usually fooling you. So I guess they're good movie. at that, right? I mean, I guess they're selling people on a lie. So, I mean, but yeah, they're just straight up lying. But they use these techniques of just forcing people, bring them over with cash, get strippers to dance in their their and top of their cars. These guys are doing like a junior league version of individual steps of an Ocean's Eleven heist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just, this movie though, I mean, it's, uh, so I was watching with my wife Megan. She joins on the on the podcast a lot. She loved it because it's just it goes for it. But there's a weird heart to it. There's a scene where where Rudy likes uh, the daughter. What Barbara Fuchs and Fuchs? That's so crazy. Like they, the studio complained about that, and they're like, "No, it's Fuchs." There's actual people whose last names are Fuchs, so it's fine. Mm-hmm. We're not doing anything wrong. And there is. So I, I just think that uh, he, he's a uh, I don't know. Just Kurt Russell's a likable dude. He's you know. You know what's interesting is on the commentary, the, Kurt Russell hadn't done many movies like this. He had he had worked on Elvis the year prior with John Carpenter, but he hadn't done Escape to New York yet. He mm-hmm. was still sort of the Disney kid. He didn't have that that like pedigree. So this is kind of interesting. This is watching a like a child actor go to R-rated territory. Mm-hmm. So this must have been interesting to watch in 80, but he nails it because he's still oh, so in this he was only 29 when he made this. And so I don't know, but he still pulls it off. He he's rakish, but then he's also very unlikable. But then you feel like he could sell you a car. But I think this was a big step up for Kurt Russell in terms of acting. And I think he nailed it. Yeah. Well, you know, this was a good time for him to make that transition, right? Because like, mm-hmm. you know, before and after it, you have your porkies, your meatballs, your National Lampoon's Animal House. Your, uh, I think, a, what a year after this, this is Spinal Tap. Not that I'm saying these are similar movies, but like the sh- the, the kind of mature, ridiculous shenanigans, the lampoonish like movies that besieged 1980 in in, in either direction, um, really just it cultivated a great environment for him to do this. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a risky movie. I, I wasn't as risky oh, yeah. a movie then. Because of that, because people were loving these movies at the time. It's it's pretty interesting, though, that he didn't really come from a rakish background. Then he jumps into a like, he didn't come from an irascible, R-rated, dirty comedy background. Right. Then he jumped into this. So I think maybe with with Vince Vaughn, with old school in the 90s, when those these movies sort of had the thing, these guys were already doing those movies. So I think it's pretty. I don't know. I just. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It, it, also, I just got to say, this is really random, but I love Kurt Russell commentaries because he laughs through 95% of them. He just cackles through all of it. And, and you know what's funny? You know, right right now is Zemeckis, right? I mean, this is a guy who did Back to the Future. He did Flight. He did The Walk, Allied, Monster House. Like he's He's been making just these gigantic films for, like, he produced The Frighteners. He directed A Christmas Carol, Castaway, What Lies Beneath, Forrest Gump. Death Becomes Her, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, so who Romancing the Stone. So right now we're, we're, we know Zemeckis as just being a guy who's won Oscars and made billion-dollar films. But it's funny, it's, it's neat going back to 1980 and seeing this is his first, I mean, aside from I Want to Hold Your Hand, but this is his first big studio picture. And Kurt Russell during it was like, man, you guys, you guys were pretty loose during the making of this. He's like, there's a <laughs> lot of, like, you see the stunts in this movie, John? They feel irresponsible. There oh, are... no, no, I, I was, so I watched this with my cousin and I out loud multiple times pointed out how risky it was when Garrett Graham was standing in the middle of the road oh. and that car sped past, you know, in yeah. so many movies, like you see the car speed past and like the, the cops radar mm-hmm. says 96 and you're watching, you're like, that's about 30 miles an hour. <laughs> like this, yeah. this car was really speeding by. You have tons of cars driving at, even if it's not that fast, very close to each other. You have a lot of cars colliding into each other on screen. You have a lot of cars going over curbs with other cars in visual close proximity. And you know a lot about that from all your car work on movies. And then you have, even at the very end, when all of the, when the mile of cars is arriving to the lot or when the cops were arriving to dig up the uh, mechanics pit 
Like they, these cars are just plowing in, and all very often, G- Garrett Graham again, when he's being chased by Fuchs by the car, he oh. runs up onto the patio. Fuchs hits the 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 pillar support, and it's and it's Garrett Graham the whole time. You see him in the beginning, ends up on the hood, mm-hmm. and like there, this whole movie, and I can't think. Mark, of unless I'm watching a Donnie Yen or a Jackie Chan or a Tony Ja movie, right? Or a Scott Adkins movie, where I would ever think this about mm-hmm. how risky the stunts are. There's that scene where Jer- uh, Garrett Graham is backing up in the road and that car zips right behind him. That yes. car missed him by two, three feet. If he would have tripped or that the stunt driver, uh, let's see, Terry Leonard, I believe his name is, who has done pretty much every single movie you can think uh, Terry Leonard. He missed him by three feet, John. He would have killed him. That would have been lights out. And and they they ramped that, that um, well, dummy ramped it, but they ramped that train. That was a private rail line. They got all those cars uh, by just going, hey, college students, come out. We'll put your car in a movie. And all those college students went out with their parents' cars or their cars, got paid a little bit, and a ton of damage got done to their cars. Wow. Like the, yeah, it's. Uh, and like you said, just that the the when when the dude got knocked back into the house, even that fight scene, you could tell the stuntmen were beating a tar out of each other. Dude, it's uh, and then you know the, they actually had those. It was the stuntman's kids who fell out of that station wagon that got sold. Okay, that was those are really kids falling They're into the, the kids mud. In the football outfit. Yeah, yeah, those were kids, and they were a stuntman's kids to to do that. They they just so in this thing. They, uh, in this in this uh, commentary, they were joking around about the cocaine kids on this movie. And I guess just the cast out there in Phoenix was just cast and crew was just like they call them the cocaine kids. They were just rolling hard on uh, partying and insane stunts. And just I guess from all what I've heard, it was a wild production making this thing. But it still works. Right? There's this is like a youthful second movie exuberance that makes it work. Does that make sense? I don't think. Uh, Seven, like a, a veteran director would make something this loose, fast, and dangerous, if that makes sense. Right. Th- this feels like sincerely like the shenanigans that someone thought up and, and never put through the filters of worrying about MPAA or, or yeah. ratings or reviews. It's like, this is, I think that people would love this if I was having beers telling you the story and that's what I'm putting on film. Oh, and that's what happened. They went and uh, cocaine. Their, yeah, and cocaine. cocaine, cocaine and beers. <laughs> yeah, they went to so Zemeckis and Gale went to one of their friends from film school's parents owned a car lot and they went to the car lot and just did research about all different stories that these guys did used car salesmen did. So a lot of these stories, they say they can only use 10 percent of them because so many were insane. But they they actually use the majority of the stories in this with the odometers and. They put high gasoline in it to hide, like uh, high caliber gasoline to hide any of the the, the bumps and, and sounds and uh, super gluing things on. And yeah, so like, you're right. I mean, this is just stories that people told that made it into a movie. And it it still has a, like, it almost, it, or it's not anarchic, like, it's not like anarchy, the structure of this movie, but it's very, it's the wrong word. Anarchy is no rules. This one just has this entropy. <laughs> This one, it's it plays fast and loose, but it's also quite tight. This movie, but it's very, it's very much of a hangout picture, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. It's not. I, I have a very hard time explaining what this movie was because the stunts that they had were not sane, and they they're like we would never do that ever, ever again. Well, e- uh, even in the very beginning, right when he casts that ten dollar bill across <laughs> six lanes of yes. highway. First off, let's talk about his casting arm. He hit that guy in the head. That's impressive. Uh, but but then he's pulling it across the street. You see this guy chasing a dollar bill. I don't even know how that actor kept a straight face because you actually see cars coming and swerving out of the way of him. Oh gosh! And and Kurt Russell, they were talking. He actually jumps. He did he did some of his own stunts, and then Dick Warlock, his stuntman for years, did the rest of the car gags. But I didn't see. There's no ropes nowadays. If this was Tom Cruise, he would be wired and harnessed. Which he should. And we'd but, still be alarmed. 